Professor Torka Klimberi is also from the Karolinska Institute, where I am from and many others here in the room. And I very well remember Torkel, our first meeting, maybe in 1990, when you were a young medical student. When was it? And I was a young researcher, and I, I can never forget this meeting. So it's so it, uh, really, it comes back now. Torkel is known f for many things, but the most important here in Singapore is something which he established, developed, and uh, actually gave to humankind COGMED. This is a fantastic training program for those who have some cognitive memory and so on deficits. And this program is, I would say we heard yesterday Mara's lecture about the failure of medicines. So this is more than a medicine because this is something which with natural cognitive and related exercises helps hundreds of thousands of children and adults. Singapore is already widely using COGMED and we expect that in the future, not only Singapore in general, but NTU in particular, and within NTU the cradle program especially will be not only a heavy user, but a heavy contributor of the research and the program, first of all, of COGMED and the research related to COGMED and other aspects of cognitive neuroscience. But I really don't want to take the word from Torkel. The best is if he introduces this whole concept, his research, and I hope you will talk shortly about COGMED also and some future perspectives regarding COGMED. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paulas, and thanks. Thank you very much for inviting me here, uh, and you and John. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the neuroscience of working memory capacity and training. Um, starting off uh, more broadly with some background about working memory uh, and working memory training. Uh, then going into measures of transfer to attention, and then working memory and its relationship to mathematics uh, in the end. So let's start uh, and just look at what I mean by working memory. So this is a visuospatial working memory task. So your task is to remember where this person points so that you can point at the same blocks in the same order. So now you're retaining four items in working memory so that you can perform an action based on your memory, such as pointing. Uh, when subjects are tested, uh, you test them uh, on a task like this where you make the load, the amount of information, gradually higher and higher. So here is an example of uh, load eight. So you do the same thing. Remember the pos positions. So I'll, I'll give this one to Balash to, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, it's, it's getting harder because our work memory capacity is limited. Uh, but the, uh, that limit is different from different individuals. With tasks, pretty simple tasks like this, you can measure then the capacity of an individual. And it, that correlates with a remarkably wide range of tasks correlates with attention, nonverbal reasoning abilities, mathematics, and reading. And if we go to clinical side, uh, we know that ADHD children uh, as a group has lower working memory. Uh, you have impaired working memory in children born prematurely, in children after cancer treatment, and, and after traumatic brain injury. So this is an uh, important concept for, for uh, cognitive neuroscience. Uh, we want to know what's the basis of capacity, uh, how does it develop in children, and how can it be improved. 
A lot of the neuroscience of working memory started with neurophysiology in, in macaque monkeys in the early 70s uh, with um, work from uh, Joachim Fuster, uh, Kubotainiki, and, and later uh, the seminal works by Patricia goldman Rakic uh, and, and others. And they have been using, uh, for example, uh, oculomotor delayed response task where a monkey sees a target there keeps the information and then makes a response after a delay. And the kind of standard um, way to understand this activity is that during the delay there is sustained activity, stimulus specific sustained activity, keeping this information in mind. As, as Wolf remarked yesterday, there are alternative ways uh, such as synaptic plasticity, but this uh, uh, would be the most um, established view of how information is kept in, in working memory. Sustained electrical activity. And if we go to humans, um, we can find pretty similar patterns. So we have sustained activity we know in both parietal and, and prefrontal cortex. And you can actually, by decoding the activity in the parietal cortex, read out uh, the visual information that is kept in working memory. So uh, information storage uh, is, can be read out at least in the parietal and, prefront, uh, and posterior prefrontal cortex, while uh, there might be another role and, and for, for more anterior regions. Um, so the one attempt has been to try to link monkey data with human neurophysiology and um, a link here has been modeling with biologically realistic neural network models and one standard model here is, is called uh, the ring model. So it contains pyramidal neurons and inhibitory neurons and these pyramidal neurons, they are Q-specific or, or sensory-specific. So, so there is a 9 o'clock neuron, a 2 o'clock neuron, etc. cetera. Uh, it retains information then by recurrent loops uh, that are sustained during a delay uh, which marks uh, the, the memory. So this, I would say, is then a kind of summary of, of what we mean by, by visuospatial uh, working memory. Uh, although, as, as Yuri told us yesterday, working memory is one of these old concepts from, uh, not William James didn't use the word, but he would say short-term memory, perhaps. I think that it's more useful to think in mechanistic terms at this level and to try to find uh, the mechanisms, and, and they might not be specific for visual-spatial working memory, but probably also visual-spatially spa uh, selective attention, <laughs> top-down attention. So if we go to human studies, uh, there are lots and lots of studies. There are differences between uh, some of the activities found for different kinds of working memory tasks. But there are also similarities, um, in particular um, prefrontal and parietal network of regions that are activated in, in many types of, of working memory tasks. Um, some call this cognitive control, but I think it might um, be uh, spatially based. So this is relating to the spatial component uh, of these tasks. And it's not just common for working memory tasks, but we see it in attentional tasks too. So this is a, a study by uh, Ika and Curtis. They have the same subjects perform either uh, a visual spatial working memory task or a spatial uh, attention task where you focus in the middle of the screen and pay attention to and put your attention either to the left or the right. And here uh, are activity and you can see commonalities between attention and working memory as blue or black and as you can see there are such commonalities in the parietal cortex superior frontal or, or precentral sulcus and and the dlpfc and the link between attention and working memory can also be seen in in human behavioral studies 
uh, including uh, studies of children with ADHD, where we know that they have an impaired working memory, and these working memory deficits are specifically linked to inattention rather than hyperactivity or, or impulsivity. Um, the inattention rather than the hyperactivity is also what predicts a poor uh, academic performance, uh, similarly to, to how work memory deficits predict uh, academic performance. So um, I started off doing re basic research about the neuroscience of working memory. This link to ADHD um, became apparent in the end of the 90s, I would say. Um, and we were interested in the question if, if we could improve working memory, and by that, if you could um, decrease inattentiveness uh, in these children. So at that time, uh, end of the nine, uh, around 1999, um, the, the uh, predominant view was that working memory could not be improved at all. It was a stable trait. Uh, but we started uh, anyway, uh, and we used more training than anyone else had done, and, and we could do that with the help of, of some technological uh, solutions. So we published uh, some studies 2002 and 2005, and that's what uh, Balash refers to as uh, came to be called COGMED training, mainly training of visual-spatial tasks. Um, later, uh, Susan Jeggi and, and John Junidas had, had uh, some, uh, another version of this using NBAC, dual NBAC training, and now there are uh, over 100 studies using different types of tasks to, 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 with training with different paradigms to see um, what the effects are in different groups with different outcome measures. So what we started off uh, was a company for a while, uh, or it still is, but I have left the company since, since many years. But it's based on repeated performance with feedback, no specific strategy instruction, adaptive difficulty close to capacity limit, it's mainly visual spatial tasks. It's pretty intense and extensive. It's about 35 minutes per day, five days a week for five weeks. And as I said, um, I have no um, associations or consultancy uh, associations or, or with, with COGMED any longer. So in the 2005 study, uh, we randomized children to either doing training uh, with difficult tasks or a control group uh, using the same looking software but with easy tasks. Uh, we measured the uh, transfer with tasks that are not part of the actual training such as the span board task uh, that I showed to you. And we could show them uh, that you have, compared to the control group, you have a significant improvement in the train group, which is retained uh, at follow-up. And there is now uh, a number of studies using specifically this method that have shown a transfer to non-trained working memory tasks, such as uh, visual spatial tasks, complex working memory tasks, cross-modal transfer or, or improvement in the ability to remember instructions um, shown by, uh, m among other, Joni Holmes. So these are specifically the, the COGMED tasks and, and the, the reason why we have this transfer might be that there are uh, common underlying um, networks used by many types of working memory tasks. They're not global, but they are, seem to be pretty prevalent and, and, and uh, useful. Going more broadly to all types of training, there has recently been a number of meta-analysis on how this uh, training transfers. And here are the results from um, Six meta-analysis looking at transfer to non-trained working memory tasks, showing pretty consistent results around uh, 0.6 standard deviations improvements relative to, to control, uh, control uh, groups. So this, I would say, seems pretty robust findings that you can improve working memory capacity. Now, there are two aims, I think, of this enterprise. One is, uh, and it, it's an experimental tool to study brain plasticity associated with higher cognitive function. Uh, and the other would be 
it could be potentially useful um, to improve your working memory and, and attention. So let's first um, look briefly at, at the neuroscience of, of working memory capacity improvement. So these uh, neural network models uh, can generate hypotheses of what kind of changes that would make for a better working memory. And we have done a couple of, of such studies um, uh, first of all, the ring models uh, by Compton, Constantinidis, and others. Um, here are two studies by a PhD student in my group. Um, the second one here, he looked at what could the impact of a prefrontal input to a storage area be. So we have a ring model here, only in the parietal cortex. We're looking at a prefrontal uh, input, and he shows that an input to this uh, area counteracts the buildup of inhibitory activity in the network and therefore uh, you have larger uh, storage capacity. So increasing the functional connectivity between prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex could in itself then increase capacity, make it more stable. There has been uh, a couple of imaging studies. We did uh, one of the first, uh, or the first in 2004, two experiments that uh, both showed increased uh, activity in parietal and prefrontal cortex. Um, we have also been interested in, in the relationship of dopamine to training. Um, given the close uh, connection between dopamine systems and, and working memory function that we know of from primate studies, for example. So in one study, we, we looked at young healthy volunteers. We measured the working memory capacity before and after training, um, mapped the regions involved in visual-spatial working memory, and uh, the density of D1 and D2 receptors uh, before and after training. Um, and then we looked at uh, the change in uh, D8, dopamine 1 uh, binding potential um, given the suggestion of an inverted U function. We used both uh, a linear and a quadratic model to try to, to capture this. Um, and there was a tendency uh, which was best described and, and significant for the quadratic model, that is given your baseline um, perform or, or D1 receptor binding potential at baseline and after training is related to, to how much uh, the subjects improved, uh, which is also consistent with prior studies in monkeys from uh, Sabaguchi and, and Goldman Rakic, for example. So, and this was significant then that we tested this in single regions too in both parietal and, and prefrontal cortex. So the, the interest and connection to dopamine have also been uh, investigated in genetic studies. Here is one of those studies. So we have 250 kids between the ages of 6 and 16, uh, and they do about 25 days of training using this computer game. So here is how the, they improve on the trained task. You can see gradual improvement rapidly in the beginning, and steadily uh, throughout the training period. But if you calculate how much they improve, it differs very much between individuals. So one in question that we're very interested in is trying to find out what's the reason behind this inter-individual uh, variability. Uh, and in this study, we had um, a set of candidate genes, uh, SNPs related to these candidate genes that were tested. and we found uh, two SNPs both related to the DRD2 gene uh, that could, that explained uh, partly why we have different improvements uh, in the different groups. Uh, later we have used uh, this gene also to look at uh, normal development in, in uh, about 800 kids from the IMAGINE study and, and found that the same SNPs that are related to training here also are related to working memory during development. Uh, and in particular, there is, seems to be an interaction with the striatal function, which makes sense given the high density of, of D2 receptors uh, in striatum. 
So the story here uh, is that we, there are a couple of studies now, around four studies looking at genetics, um, implicating uh, either DAT1 or DRD2 receptors, um, which f would fit with some of the imaging data implicating the striatum uh, in the training effect. So this seems to be, be part of the reasons for, for the change we see. We have also uh, trying to relate uh, what's happening during training with what's happening during development. Um, and there's a connection in particular to the function of the striatum here. So in one study, it's a longitudinal study where we follow children uh, during several years and we measure them every second year. So what you see here is the age in months. Each uh, line is a child. Uh, so you can see there is a development of working memory capacity during childhood, but it's also considerable um, variability, both in, in, in the absolute capacity, but also in the rate of, of change. So what we're trying to do is see if we can measure a kid at one time point and predict the working memory capacity two years later and we're using uh, support vector regression methods uh, to do this. So what we started with was looking at both bold activity, fraction and isotropy, and, and gray matter density. And with this model and testing, of course, with, with leave one out um, um, uh, validation, we find that all three modalities have some predictive uh, values. Uh, although it's weakest for, for gray matter density in this case. And if you put these measures together, um, the gray matter density did not have a unique contribution, but, it's, but both BOLD and FA contributed to this, um, to this model, and we have a correlation of 0.64 with working memory capacity two years uh, later. Then we added on top of that uh, the baseline working memory performance. So we have both scanning at baseline and we have work memory performance at baseline and then we're trying to predict uh, working memory two years later. And if you add them together, you increase this 0.64 correlation to a 0.78 correlation like this. So in this model, we have a unique contribution of both MRI and uh, the baseline visuospatial work memory task when we try to predict the same task two years later. But once we have MRI and visual spatial working memory, we can't uh, predict anything better by adding a, s a second working memory task or third working memory task or an IQ or uh, adding age to this. But th what this shows is that pretty interestingly, we can use the MRI to say something unique that we couldn't predict with uh, per uh, behavioral performance only. So it would be interesting to, to see where does that unique information come from. So we parceled up the, the variability in variability that is relating, predicting future work memory capacity, but also correlating with present work memory capacity. And that is the frontal parietal networks that we know since before in cross-sectional uh, 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 cross analysis are correlated with current capacity. But then when we looked at this variability, so MR signal that predicts something about future capacity that could not be predicted by, by current capacity, then we found subcortical regions. So it's bold activity in the striatum and fraction and anisotropy in uh, surrounding uh, abilities. So that showed a pretty interesting difference between uh, change current capacity and, and, and areas presumably uh, promoting uh, the change in capacity. We followed this up with other track tracing methods too, uh, showing that it's, it is indeed uh, tracked, tracked passing from the striatum uh, to the prefrontal cortex. And this is then is, is also uh, consistent with, with the uh, training status. So here is an overview of the different uh, studies uh, from our and other groups um, about what we think that we see during work and memory training. So in red here, uh, it's the work 
from neural network modeling, suggesting that strengthening intra and intranetwork connectivity provides a more stable uh, working memory and with a higher capacity. In green, it's the human neuroimaging showing that we have modulation in frontal and parietal activity, but also, and which I think is, is very interesting, several studies showing increased functional connectivity between the frontal and parietal region. Possibly then uh, an, an aspect of, of simply Hebbian plasticity, which uh, where, where this strengthening connectivity would provide a better working memory. There is also a series of studies from um, Christos Konstantinidis lab looking at working memory training in macaque monkeys. And two of the take home messages there is that they see increasing uh, firing rate during the delay. And this increase in firing rate also goes very well uh, with what the neural network models predict. They also see more neurons uh, with delay activity. And then the striatal stories, uh, which comes both from imaging studies, including PET studies showing increasing striatal dopamine release, uh, and several uh, studies showing uh, gene-dependent differences in dopamine signal, uh, that is, SNPs related to the dopamine system that predicts um, the amount of improvement during training. So another way to, to illustrate this would be that we have a network of, of areas where you have storage of visuospatial information. You have prefrontal area providing top-down, uh, uh, which benefits stability and, and capacity in these regions. Um, and then striatal uh, regions that for some reason that we don't understand possibly could facilitate how uh, these uh, networks strengths, strengthens um, with the training. So, um, to the second aspect there, the potentially usefulness. So, as I said before, working memory training correlates with a lot of things. So, in the beginning, of course, people didn't know what to expect and what to measure, um, what kind of transport you would measure. All of these have been uh, tested. Um, a recent meta-analysis of IQ suggests that you don't have uh, transfer of work memory to IQ. Um, for mathematics and reading, the, the evidence is mixed. You have both positive and negative findings, and I will go, go into that uh, later in the talk. Uh, but where I think there are most evidence right now is that you see uh, improvement of attention, which would also fit with the close connection, the neural uh, similarity of, of issue spatial work memory and, and attention. So right now, there are five um, independent randomized control studies uh, with active control groups showing improvement uh, in attention after training. Uh, we had the first one from 2005 showing uh, improvement uh, in the uh, treatment group versus uh, the control group. And as you can see, you see the improvement for inattention, not for hyperactivity, uh, impulsivity. Um, a second study or, or another study was in young and older healthy uh, volunteers, uh, 15 each group, again randomized control blinded, uh, where they see improvements in cognitive tasks, uh, measuring working memory, but also when they measure everyday inattentiveness with a cognitive failure questionnaire. Um, this is an, an American study which I think is, is very interesting because of the measure of attention they used. Um, they, rather than using rating scales, they actually film the kids and then each film is, is rated by blinded observers to, to, to uh, quantify the amount of inattentiveness uh, during a 15-minute session. And here they can see then improvement, improvement in, in the treatment versus the control group in, in attentive behavior. It could be pretty subtle things such as whether they are looking what they're supposed to look at rather than looking somewhere else. Uh, another uh, study of, of children with ADHD and, and uh, a fifth study here uh, from, uh, from US looking at children after cancer treatment. So with cancer treatment, uh, including radiation, you see deficits in attention and working memory, 
um, and there is no much uh, alternative treatments here, but here they show uh, that training compared to control group improved uh, attention. And uh, postdoc in my group, uh, Megan uh, Spencer Smith, she and I did a meta analysis looking at all studies specifically using Cogman training that had included some kind of attention measures. Um, and if you summarize up those studies, you see an overall effect size of 0.4, uh, which is uh, highly significant. So I think it's uh, the evidence for improvement of, of attention are, are pretty robust. But what about other uh, tasks, uh, such, as work, such as mathematics? So working memory capacity is correlated uh, with um, arithmetic performance, both in children with and without known uh, learning difficulties. Uh, and working memory capacity predicts future development of arithmetic ability. Um, and work memory and reasoning ability contribute to partly unique variants to predict academics. And then there is, of course, uh, the uh, question of, of, of a neural basis for this overlap. Um, Stan Dehan here uh, and, and his co-workers has done a series of studies looking at the spatial aspect of mathematics, which could be related to the parietal cortex, and in this study <coughs> specifically showing that um, there are similarities in the pattern of activity uh, with, um, with spatial uh, saccades uh, and, and calculation again pointing to the parietal cortex as a key region for why we see this uh, link between spatial abilities and, and mathematics. So one study we did, we scanned children, uh, this is children between 6 and, six and, and 18, during performance of a visual spatial work memory task and looked specifically at the parietal cortex and showed uh, that activity here is correlated not only to present performance, but also can predict future uh, arith arithmetic performance. <coughs> so there is overlap, um, seems to be overlap in the parietal activity here, but parietal cortex contains many regions, and, and these uh, group analysis, they kind of blur the signal. So it could be that you have a working memory region very close to a, a, a region that underlies um, number sense or, or, or arithmetic operations. And when you do these analysis, they are blurred. So we wanted to get at, uh, ideally we would like to have site architecture uh, maps of the parietal cortex in each individual to, to try to, to have an individual analysis of, of activity in, in these regions. The second best, that, but we can't have that of course, um, Instead, we try to define different parietal regions by looking at the connectivity. So we looked at the parietal cortex and defined three different regions here, depending on whether the voxels were most strongly connected to the frontal lobe, to the inferior parietal lobe, or to the occipital lobe. Um, and um, this um, frontal uh, area here is, is closely connected or in, in lo located, the average location is, is pretty similar to cytoarchitecture uh, region uh, IPS2. So then we correlated um, gray matter thickness in these regions in each individual with performance in mathematics, nonverbal reasoning, reasoning or, or visuospatial working memory. And then we found here that in the left IPS, it was correlated to both nonverbal reasoning and visual spatial work memory. The left occipitally connected IPS was uh, correlated with both mathematics and visual spatial work memory. But the right frontal IPS was only uh, correlated to mathematics. So it's, it's this region here. So this was in, in children between 8 and 18, roughly. Uh, then we tried to replicate this in a set of children, uh, six-year-old children. But what we found then was that this frontal region, it was significantly associated with mathematics also in six-year-olds. But in six-year-olds, it was also correlated with working memory. So it was less specific. So then when we, we went back to the developmental sample 
and showed that, yes, there is an interaction between age and the involvement of, of visual spatial working memory. So if we subdivide the children, in the younger children, we see that um, the, the cortical thickness is related both to mathematics and visual spatial working memory, but in the older children, it's only mathematics and not working memory. So this could be evidence of, of a type of, of uh, specialization, or, or at least going away from a more general spatial role to a more specific spatial role. But what about uh, the involvement uh, of training and the effect of, of working memory? Here, there are um, conflicting evidence. So as you can see here, some studies have found effects. Uh, some studies have found small effects that are not significant. Uh, small effects that are significant or no effects at all. So we wanted to look further at this to look at the com and, and our idea was to look at the combination of working memory and mathematical training. And this is a collaboration with, with Pekka Resenen and, and Ola Helenius among others. Uh, and uh, Federico Nemo, who's a postdoc in my lab, uh, analyzed uh, these data. So we randomized children into four groups uh, so children doing uh, either reading or reading and work memory or reading and number line training, so that is mathematical training, or number line training and working memory. So that means that it's a two-factor uh, structure here. They do this about 30 minutes per day for eight weeks. Um, we had two groups of, of six-year-olds, um, both typically developing children and children with low working memory capacity. And they do this training in the classroom uh, in groups. So for this, we developed a new training task. Um, it's uh, with the help of a nonprofit organization. So this is distributed freely. We call it Vector. You can't really see it, but it's a figure here. Basically, we use number lines for everything. So they start by just trying to find a number on the number line here. Um, which kind of, even this simple task, combines a number of representation. It's a symbol, it's a place on the number line, it's a length, if you, you drag your f index finger from the zero here, so it's a length, uh, and it's also a length made up of, of single uh, units. And then you can extend this um, by doing addition, you can go to larger uh, numbers, and you can extend it to subtraction, negative numbers, decimals, and, and fractions. And we also had uh, working memory tasks. Uh, we looked at the outcome with working memory, a number of working memory tasks combined to a composite score, a number of mathematical tasks combined to composite score, and we did fMRI uh, and structural MRI before and after. And we analyzed the effect um, in a factorial way, looking at the work memory training factor and, and mathematical training factor. And here are the results. So here we're looking at m improvement in mathematical tasks. Sorry. Um, so we see here is the improvement in the reading group in the working memory training group, in the number line training group, and in the combined group. So they all have the same amount of, of training, but of different type. So overall, the number line training factor was significant. So they do benefit from use, training with a number line. The working memory training factor in itself was not uh, significant. Uh, but we do have a significant interaction between baseline working memory score and working memory training. And the combined group was the only one, if you do it group-wise comparison, it's the only group where we have this um, significant improvement and the largest improvement here. So this interaction is pretty interesting then. It means that what, if we look at the residuals here, so that is comparing to the average trainer, you benefit more from working memory training the higher working memory you had at baseline. And remember, the outcome here is mathematical improvements. So this is a positive interaction. And you can break this down further 
to uh, look at the different groups. So here our subjects are grouped based on their working memory capacity at baseline. So you can see here in the higher performer, those children that started out with a higher working memory capacity, they actually benefited more from working memory than from, from number line training. Uh, and the pattern is, is also interesting here relating to baseline mathematical performance where you seem to have a stronger effect uh, of the interaction in some groups. So this seems to be a pretty complex um, pattern of, of how the improvement uh, in color here is related to baseline mathematical and baseline uh, working memory performance. So overall, I think this points at the fact that we shouldn't treat all kids um, in the same way, but if you measure the baseline characteristics, you would be able to fine tune the, the type of, of training that children most benefit from. And an additional question was, could neuroimaging play any role in, in this fine tuning? So we looked at um, uh, baseline bold and gray matter density in, in regions previously associated with either work memory or mathematics. And a number of regions uh, in the superior frontal cortex, the parietal regions, and occipital cortex showed an interaction with the type of training or with, it, with specifically the, the interaction of training. So what that means uh, concretely then is that, for example, depending on your bold activity in this region, uh, you react differently to the combination of training. So if you have a low bold, you don't benefit very much from, from the combination of training. If you add up the yellow bar here on top of the uh, blue bar, uh, that will be higher than the green bar. But that is not true here. For those with high bold, actually the combination is, is more than the sum. And importantly, uh, what it showed was that imaging contributed significantly to outcome also after taking all behavioral measures into account. So I will not, these, are, these regions are related to both visual-spatial working memory and, and, and mathematics since previously, but it tells us in principle an interesting finding that one contribution of neuroscience in the future could be to be able to predict what kind of training each individual uh, benefits most from. So to conclude, um, I think I showed here that working memory training improves um, working memory, for example, remembering instruction and, and measures of inattention in everyday life with effect sizes of around 0.6 for working memory and 0.4 for, for uh, inattention. Regarding other things such as mathematics, IQ, reading, grades, etc., we still don't really know. There are uh, opposite, uh, conflicting results, and I think that we need to know more about the, the differences between individuals and looking at the, the baseline characteristics. For future uh, directions in this area, I think we'd need better measures of attention uh, in everyday life. We cannot rely on these uh, questionnaires, but uh, using uh, quantified measures in somehow. I think training studies in general need to move to larger populations. Um, th we need to follow uh, in the directions of, of pharmacological studies, wh which use hundreds of, of subjects, or genetic studies, for example, that has gradually moved and realized how, how large samples you really need. Uh, I think that it could be interesting in the future to look at combinations of training, and in particularly targeted training depending on, on baseline characteristics uh, and I do hope for a continued role of, of neuroscience uh, in this field. So with that I would like to thank you for your attention very much. Thank you so much. Dr. I'm sure that there will be many questions because NTU is extremely interested in enhancing their students learning capacities and of course, this is why we would like to team with you here at NTU. So, questions? Yes. Hi, um, great talk. Um, I might have missed 
a little bit of the first 15 minutes of a talk, but uh, just one question. There is a plethora of brain training exercises out there from Lumosity, um, Brain HQ, Science Posit. So what is it that distinguishes COTMET from the rest of the other web-based training exercises? Well, I, I can't uh, describe every single exercise. But I, I think that you, you, um, you should keep a null, null hypothesis in mind. And, and um, you don't know what works until you've tested it. So what you should look out for is, is controlled, randomized controlled trials and, and look for the evidence. Yeah, and a second question that's, I'm sorry, a second question that's related to the first one. And so um, there has been meta-analysis done on effects of um, computerized cognitive exercises. Um, and the effect size is actually small to moderate. And what is your take on, on these small to moderate effect sizes? Is it because of the lack of a coach being around to teach the children or to transfer these cognitive exercises to real life situations. Because um, a lot of these are very specific, they're very targeted exercises, targeted towards improving working memory. But when you talk about ADHD on a whole, it's more about lapses of attention in real life situations rather than, you know, discrete measures of psychological constructs. Um, well, you can speculate in, in, in many things. I, what this data suggests, uh, I think, is that you have an improvement of inattention that is ADHD symptomatology of around 0.4. So if that holds up, I think it's great. Um, how much, what's the effect size of SSRI? It's 0.3 for, for severe uh, depression. How much do you improve working memory when you take methylphenidate? It's 0.25. That's the cognitive effect of, of methylphenidate. What's the effect of physical training on working memory? 0.15. Uh, and that's the immediate effect. So we sh it's extremely difficult to change cognitive uh, aspects, uh, as been shown by, by the failure of in, in, in the or, or difficulties in, in the pharmacological uh, industries. So I think that we should be grateful if we can have something that is harmless and improves attentional symptoms with an effect size of 0.4. So uh, Suresh and then Guy. Suresh. Yeah, so I'm just maybe an anecdotal kind of thing is like when, when you have people who have extremely good memories, like they can memorize phone books and things like that, right? Do they And that's long-term memory. Oh, I see. So, so you don't have such cases of, of short-term people? With, no. I mean, no. extreme. Okay. The, the other thing I wanted to ask is, is about um, um, more traditional practices, say mindfulness meditation. Does that kind of a practice improve attention? I think it could. I mean, if, if the same system underlies both working memory and attention, and training working memory improves attention, then you should have the corollary, the training of attention should improve working memory. And there is one great study of mindfulness from the Max Planck Institute coming out that I saw recently, where they looked specifically at the attention training aspects of mindfulness and show significant improvements in, in working memory. Yeah. I have a comment, comment and a question. The comment is very simple. You said individual cytoarchitectonic maps are not available but we have all the maximum probability maps on our flat maps of the posterior parietal cortex, so you could easily, we can make them available to you, yeah. and you could easily refine your, your study with your three parts. I'm sure you would find much more refined and interesting effects. The question is, there are many aspects to uh, working memory. Capacity is one. Uh, resistance to distractors is another one. Moving in and out of working memory is another. Long time ago, one of my gifted medical students, like Balash, in the, two, in the years 2000, did a, several PET studies where we studied all this. And, and one of them was uh, uh, resistance to the distractors, which I think loaded, uh, increased the activity in the premotor component. And, and I wonder whether it would not be worthwhile to consider that, especially with mathematics, where if you do an operation, by definition, you have a second term that comes in. So the resistance to the distractors, to me, seems like an important 
something you may want to yeah, add yeah, in your yeah, I, I totally agree. comparison. Uh, I start with the second comment there. I, this is absolutely something that is of interest to look at the subparts of, of a working yeah, memory task. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the role of precision is something that we're looking at, so precision versus, but we also looked at the distractibility, so it's a paper from 2008, uh, Nature Neuroscience, trying to dissect uh, the different aspects, specifically during filtering out of distractors um, that, that we published together with Fiona McNabb. Back to your first question about the site architectonics, I was unclear there. So the, the point is that we want to get individually, we think that there is inter-individual variability in the location that you need to get at. So we took these site the, the, the standard site architectural maps of, 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 of IP, the IP123, uh, and tried the same analysis there, but there was no significant result. So, but then we, when, we, when we could do the connectivity-based analysis, then we had the significant results. So that shows that there is something to gain by moving into individual regions, and, and I hope that, that uh, approaches such as, 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 uh, as we heard um, Paul Matthews here talking about, where you can try to find these maps in individuals would be extremely uh, useful for us. Now, I can see your point about individual variation, but the tree H is only covering the, a small part of the IPS. You have many other uh, parcels uh, that you could incorporate because your three regions were much wider than H, I, P, one, two, two, three. Yeah, so it uh, might be interesting our, our region was mostly close. The, the frontal one is m mo most uh, similar to the, the number two there uh, of, the, of the horizontal section of IPS there. But as I said, if we can use connectivity and, and other maps to try to, yeah, find this in vivo, uh, it would be great. Um, here. Thank you, Tokel, for a very interesting and um, very informative talk, especially about the nuances of working memory training. Um, as you know, we've been doing uh, working memory research in adults, looking at verbal and spatial working memory, and we found very specific cell bellar activations connected to these cerebral um, networks. I'm just wondering, in your studies, especially in children, if you saw any cell bell activations or any changes uh, with the working memory training? Um, we haven't um, reported or, or, or seen that, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> so when I did an, an overview and tried to summarize uh, what seems to be consistent across studies. There are like 20 imaging studies now. Cerebellum is, is not a consistent finding. I, I think there were one or two studies finding something in cerebellum, but the frontal parietal changes uh, and together with the striatum are the most consistent findings, I would say. Yes, I, I, a very interesting talk, and of course we, we could talk about the education content consequences, but I want to ask you a different question instead. Uh, you insisted on the sustained activity as a characteristic of working memory, and of course that's been the, the sort of standard view, but there is a new view emerging now, which is that uh, sustained activity may not be needed. It might, it might be a sort of artifact of averaging across many trials, and what happens instead is on single trial is only little bursts, and maybe everything else in working memory is actually coded in synaptic efficacies, and Wolf alluded to this, and mm -hmm. this beautiful work by Misha Tsodix uh, showing how this could work. So I was wondering how that would change the picture that you were showing us if working memory was really not so much in sustained activity, which of course has to be there occasionally to refresh the system, rehearsal as Batley would call it, but in fact most of the working memory was in short up synaptic, uh, synaptic mm -hmm. efficacy. Well, uh, then we need to find out what would make for a better working memory using that type of synaptic plasticity. Um, we have in the paper that came, the Nature, Neuroscience, Nature Revenue Neuroscience paper that came out this year, we, we discussed particularly that aspect and, and the alternative models and, and the pros and, and cons. Um, but more generally, first of all, these hypotheses um, this is a hypothesis of how Hebbian plasticity 
could contribute to better working memory capacity. If it's a firing, um, it, if, if the sustained sustainment of information is based on some kind of sustained firing patterning, uh, not necessarily the exactly the same neurons during the whole delay, but, but some sustained firing in this network. Um, but having said that, probably there are many ways that the human brain uses for, for storing information, and, and one mechanism does not exclude the other. Uh, and in real life, I, I assume that we're using both work memory and long-term memory in parallel all the time, and, and very likely uh, other mechanisms too, so that they are not mutually exclusive, I would say. I think the, the, the new view is interesting because it suggests that you may have to learn to manage working memory. Maybe working memory itself is a sort of passive property of decaying synapses, but if you don't learn to refresh at the proper times, then you will lose it. Mm. So uh, I wonder whether that changes the view into a more strategic view of working memory, where you have to know that you're going to forget yeah. and come back to the items and rehearse, and maybe the kids who do better are the ones that have learned to rehearse at the proper time, so to manage their working memory. Mm. Yeah. We need a way to test it, just. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, maybe you said this, but in terms of the built-up of the working memory, is that linear postnatal, or are there windows during time when you are more susceptible, you are basically, you accelerate your working memory capacity, meaning that if you are exposed to a nutritional constraint at that given time period, you may acquire an ability to reduce working memory capacity? Yeah. Um, regarding the development, it's, it's, it's gradual during development. It's, it's best described as an inverse function approaching an asymptote uh, around the age of, of 23, 25. Um, regarding windows, of course, we know the, the uh, severe effects of, of early maltreatment, for example that seems to be have permanent effect of, of both cognition and emotion. But when we analyze the amount of improvement uh, of individuals of different ages, and we have everything from four to, to, to 70 year old uh, persons who've, do, who've done training, there's no evidence of, of a stepwise decrease in, in, in capacity. Slight, slightly less improvements in, in 60 years old compared to 20 years old, for example, uh, but, but no clear windows. <coughs> the reason I mention this is that there are um, nutritional mass spectrometry data on kids from Philippines, from Nestlé, and they basically have sort of reclassified <coughs> the age of the kids depending on the metabolomic spectrum. Mm -hmm. So you can have a kid which is biological 14, but based on mass spec is 12. And of course that would have a tremendous impact, um, I would imagine, when you do your recording in terms of working memory. Interesting. I just want to get your view with the digital devices being so used so frequently. How will you look at the whole working memory for all age group, as well as those that is whether attention disorders or even for normal individual? Sorry, sorry, what was the question? With, yeah. with the with, with the with the widespread of digital devices, how would all this impact the whole ideas of working memory? With devices, yes. technical devices, how it would impact the the whole concept of working memory for, for, for different group of people, whether it's normal, so-called, or attention disorder, or whatever you have it. Thanks. So how, how would it affect the, the I don't see, what, what you suggest? Well, the, you see, even for a lot of adult, you can't help. Once you have a digital device, most people can't even recall a lot of phone number. Yeah, but that's, so, lo uh, that's long-term memory, right? Even for short-term. Well, uh, usually we talk about working memory as, as very short abilities. For example, if, you, if I should solve a problem, you keep important information in mind while you're solving the problem. Yes. Uh, or if I give you, you ask for the direction uh, to, the, to the bathroom, 
I s tell you to, to go and take the first left and then the second door to the right, then you keep that instruction in mind until you reach the position. So I don't think you will need use a cell phone in those. Uh, well, you'll be, you'll be surprised. And also the other areas is uh, internal attention span. Increasingly, I work with a lot of young people, especially in the corporate world. I can tell you that. In the past, without the days of a handphone, people would pay a lot of attention in corporate world. With today's, forget about whatever you say. Every few minutes, they will turn to their handphone. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, so that, so that's how would you aspect. then look at this whole thing? That's what I want to get your yeah, view on that. I mean, that's back to the question of distractions, for example. So distractions are, are harmful for our ability. I mean, if you get distracted, you can lose the information you have in working memory. And people with lower working memory, they are more susceptible to, to distractions. So with all these uh, cell phones and, and tweets and, and, and so on, you, you get m distracted more often and in more environment. Yes, I, I certainly think so. Um, whether it has a permanent effect on, on working memory, I would be, I don't think so, but, but I haven't seen any real data. But at the moment, of, at the moment that when this happens, of course it impacts your, your ability to keep information in working memory and understand what people are presenting, yeah. Questions? I have a question on your graph on individual working memory developments in children, which you followed over some years. Surprisingly, many child or children had a decrease, so the lines were not always going up. Some lines were just yeah. showing a lower yeah. working memory performance after two years. So. Can you follow it up for a longer time and then see if there are variations? Or, and this is the question, can you use it as a biomarker, a cognitive biomarker to predict some problems? Well, uh, we don't know. I mean, of course, there's a lot of noise. Uh, this was data from one particular task. And if you look at one particular task, you can have a bad day. Um, things such as stress, uh, sleep, uh, nutrition, I mean, have you eaten or not? A lot of things uh, affect um, work memory capacity hour by hour or day by day. But on top of that, there are the long trends, and, and those are the ones we're trying to understand. Um, and biomarkers, uh, I mean, that relates to can we use imaging, neuroimaging, for example, to predict which kids are in risk for a poor cognitive development. Yeah. Further questions? If not, let me thank you, Torkel, okay, thank for you. this great talk. <laughs> <laughs>